RD are still checking on information supplied from members of the public in response to Garda the searches searches for assistance. The marks of a murder she inquiry. The family say her disappearance is totally out of character. This is a story in two parts. To her family. She never arrives. Throughout the 1990s, a series of young women vanish without a trace. The American student Annie McCarrick disappears. Someone knows. George O'Donnell is very scary, and today they know that his appearance remains a mystery. Patricia McGauley with Mary Commons. Found traces of blood in the house. Now Gardy believed Deirdre Jacob was killed. The if there is no body, then you have no crime scene. Leaving their families in the dark. We got a call that uh, Annie was missing. I was four years old when my mum never came home. Looking for answers. It was as if she had disappeared into thin air. In the three of the cases, there were very good suspects. The false alibi hindered the case greatly. Most of these cases remain unsolved decades later, raising fresh questions about how they were investigated. What were they appealing for? She was given the information, but nobody came together from her. Is this a missing case or is it a murder case? What else could they have missed? Today, Gardaí upgraded the Annie McCarrick case to a murder inquiry, prompting fears that the same killer may have abducted some of these women. There could be a serial killer roaming Kildare, Dublin, the mountains, dumping their bodies. Within an area that becomes known as the Vanishing Triangle. It's Friday, the 26th of March, 1993. A young American woman gets on a bus towards Wicklow. She has plans with friends over the weekend and is excited about a visit from her mother. But the 26-year-old never keeps those plans. Annie McCarrick vanishes without a trace. She is the first of a number of women to go missing in a five-year period whose bodies are never found. In time, some of these cases will provoke fears of a murder triangle, stretching from Dundalk in the north to Wexford in the south and Tullamore in the Midlands. My name is Nancy McCarrick, and Annie was my daughter. Oh, yes, Mom, I can fit in the white dress now. I oh, feel so stupid looking at this camera. I'll look at you instead. Um, there. <laughs> um, most people now think I'm Irish. I have the keys, Mom? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Annie was my only child. What, I don't know what to do. What do well, I do? Well, talk to Nana and Papa, yeah. Um, okay, let's be natural about this. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> she was um, funny. Yes, she was re very reliable. She was conscientious. She wasn't fearful. Can't wait to see you at Christmas. And, um, she couldn't find fault with Ireland. Sun shower or something outside. Saw double rainbow the other day. Oh, let's go, Annie. <laughs> let's go, Annie. A day after she is last seen alive, Annie's friends begin to worry. She has failed to turn up for a pre-arranged dinner in her apartment that evening. 24 hours later, one of those friends contacts Gardaí to report her missing. It is Sunday, the 28th of March. Val Smith is one of the first detectives on the scene. Remember it well. 
was divorced, was there, and she was after doing shopping that day, and I don't know why you got to go out and do shopping and leave the shopping there as she didn't intend coming back. The girl said she was very solid and she didn't seem to be a girl that was just going to go missing. Detective Tom Rock also joins the investigation. She made no contact with anybody over the weekend of the Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We have people going missing for all sorts of reasons. But in this case, there was absolutely no reason for any McCarrick to go missing. Gardaí, examining financial records, discovered she had been... In Gardaí quickly established a timeline of her movements. ...because Annie McCarrick is wearing the same jacket, carrying the same handbag and wearing her hair... On the day she disappears, Annie visits the AIB bank in Sandymount, where she is captured on CCTV before going grocery shopping in a nearby supermarket. Gardaí can place her in Ranala at 3.30 when she took the 44 bus to Enniskerry. The last sight of Annie McCarrick was getting on the bus at 3.40, going towards Inniscarry. And that was Annie seen by a person who knew her and walked. And she saw her going upstairs and getting on that particular bus. For her family in New York, Annie's disappearance is completely out of character. Maureen Covell is Annie's aunt and confidant. I would try to be the mature older sister, although an aunt, and talk her through different things here and there. It was very scary and obviously even more so being 3,000 miles away. There was no really way to track her, so things were very confusing and we were trying to decipher if she was behaving completely out of character. Our suspicions and worries were heightened very quickly. Within hours of hearing her daughter is missing, Nancy decides to act. No one had seen or heard from her since Friday. So I booked a flight on Aer Lingus as soon as I could, and I went over to Ireland. I arrived on the following Tuesday went to see the Garda. We asked them to investigate her disappearance. They really felt she could very easily have gone off on an adventure. And I said, no, living in Ireland was her dream and her adventure. She would certainly not be out on her own anyplace else. But they did explain that because of her age, they had to wait a certain period of time before they could actually start looking for her. By now, frantic with worry and unhappy with the pace of the Garda investigation, her family organised their own searches. If they couldn't start looking, we would. If Annie sees this, what, what would you like to say to her? Let us know where she is. She doesn't even have to do that. Just let us know she's all right. Annie's father, John, and her uncle, also John, arrive to help with the search. We were seen taking the 44 bus down to Enniscary. For Annie time. McCarrick's family, it's been a living nightmare. This morning... The first couple of days was just trying to get a sense where she might have been. Totally out of character. We did a lot of just kind of our, on our own. Um, she may have got to and to we went up to Powers Court, Enniscary. We tried to retrace whatever steps we thought Annie might have made. Trying to find some clue as to her whereabouts. And I remember spending time walking through the woods and walking through the hills. Annie McCarrick's mother had been due to visit her daughter a few days after she went missing. This morning, her father was at pains to thank the Gordy and the public for all their help. John and John Covell were meeting with the garden and asking them to please, please start a search for her. Which means that for John McCarrick and his wife, Nancy, the waiting goes on. To the Garda, they were empathetic, sympathetic, and it was nobody was rude or dismissive, but it's just, you know, give it time, give it time. Um, that didn't satisfy us. 
A week after she is reported missing, a Garda incident room is established. In total, there will have been 50 detectives allocated, and I took charge of that incident room. Meanwhile, the family continue their attempts to locate Annie. They hire a respected private detective named Brian McCarthy. We were able to compile quite a good image and a description, and that was put out in, in posters all across Dublin City. Dart stations, bars, restaurants, the usual places where people would congregate. The McCarricks also canvass locals in Enniskerry village. This soon yields results. Annie McCarrick, who was living in Dublin, got a bus to Enniskerry on March 26th. She bought stamps at the local post office about four o'clock. The postmistress tells them she sold stamps to a woman fitting Annie's description on the day she disappeared. Gardy said the search will continue here for at least the next few days. Gardy appeal for anyone who may have received post from Annie to contact them. Nobody came forward and said they had received any letter or postcard in the post. As a result of that information, which was provided by the postmistress, we also did a mass canvas of Inniscarry and its surrounds, and nobody again came forward. Then, a breakthrough. Sam Doran, a doorman at Johnny Fox's pub deep in the Dublin mountains, recalls seeing Annie there. The girl, she came in there and she strolled over, just about over there. And at that stage, I just caught by the arm and I said, sorry, no, there's a cover charge in here. At that stage, she stopped and she looked in her bag like if she was looking for money, but it wasn't like if she was going to get money. At that stage, the chap behind, he said, I'll get that. That was a sighting from a description and from photographs showing to him. This evening, the Gordy released a computer fit of the man. He's in his mid-twenties, between five foot nine and five foot ten, with dark brown hair. The whole focus of the investigation then, for a good couple of weeks, switched to Johnny Fox's and its surrounds. We established a mobile communication centre out there, and we issued questionnaires to everybody, and we sought anybody that was in Johnny Fox's that night to come forward and assist us in our investigation. She indicated that she was going to Enniskerry in County Wicklow for a walk, but despite extensive garden inquiries... And John McCarrick from... The McCarrick's search for their daughter attracts widespread media attention. Senior US politicians lobby the Irish government to allocate resources to the investigation. By now, almost 50 detectives are involved, but it still remains classified as a missing persons case. But keep looking, gotta keep hoping. That's all we, you know, all we can do. That's what I think a father and mother have to do, you know. Uh, we won't give up hope. John was the front man. I felt at the time that anything that put her name forward was fine. Today, hundreds of volunteers turned up to try to find some trace of Annie Bacarick. The search was directed by the Dublin Mountain Rescue Service, who left people in no doubt about how grave the situation was. Um, you're searching for a missing person today in whatever shape or form that may take. You're also looking for any item of either clothing or um, I believe Annie had a a large shoulder bag. Despite extensive inquiries and searches, no further trace of her has been found in that area. Despite weeks of detailed searches, detectives failed to corroborate the sighting of Annie and Johnny Fox's on the night she disappeared. We couldn't find any trace of Annie McCarry in Johnny Fox's, other than the sighting by the doorman on the way.
followed up, never contacted her to get more details. On the 26th of March, the day Annie disappeared, she was seen getting on a bus for Enniskerry. 26-year-old Annie McCarrick has disappeared without a trace. Searches, her disappearance remains a mystery. She has gone missing in an area that will in time become known as the Vanishing Triangle. And today, Gardy again appealed to... The Gartha searches in Enniskerry in County Wicklow and the nearby Johnny Fox's pub produce no new leads. She had a drink here in the Dublin mountains, then she mysteriously vanished. Since Annie disappeared, her bank cards have not been used. But has something been missed? This is Una Wogan. On the day Annie disappeared, her mother Margaret is finishing a shift in Poppy's Cafe in Enniskerry Village. My mum told me that she was 100% sure that Annie was in Poppy's with a man that afternoon. My mum had a very good description of the whole interaction she had with the couple that came in. She could describe everything about them and, and she conveyed that to us. At the end of her shift, she was ready to go around four o'clock, but she had stayed a little bit over. And uh, an American woman came in with a man and they ordered some food, so she served him. And that was the last person she served that day before she left. Two things I do remember very clearly that the man was shorter than Annie and that he had a square face. The jaw was quite square lined, you know, the whole face. So that's what stood out to her about him, you know. Mammy's description was that he was a bit gruff. She was much more friendly and smiley and he was a bit gruff. He didn't really speak. Teams of detectives in Enniskerry Village are eager to talk to anyone who can place Annie there. Una's mother reports what she has seen. A detective came in and asked, did they have any information about Annie? This is uh, sometime after she disappeared. And Mam sat down at the table in Poppy's and gave a full account of the interaction she had and why she thought it was Annie. She thought it was odd that he didn't write anything down, but she assumed that somebody would come and take a statement from her. But that never happens. She never doubted herself. She thought it was strange that nobody came, even to disprove it. You know, it niggled at her, and she repeated it many, many times, you know? I mean, the last conversation I had about it with her was 2018. She said one of her biggest regrets was that she saw Annie's parents on the town clock when there was a reenactment being filmed, and she wanted to go over and say to them, I'm sure I saw your daughter, but because they were surrounded by guards and other people, she thought maybe that her story was disregarded, so she didn't go over, but she said she regretted that. For those involved in the investigation, Margaret Wogan's sighting at Poppy's Cafe is puzzling. I can say for definite that was not brought to the notice of the investigation team. I was managing the incident room. It is strange because Whoever that person was, and if that incident happened, again, that would have been followed up and investigated to a conclusion. Una Wogan says that her mother attempted to contact Gardaí again after seeing a public appeal for information. But nothing happened. She felt then that maybe what she remembered didn't fit into the narrative, and that's maybe why the guards didn't come back to her. They had certain information and the timeline or the narrative didn't fit, you know. We were so mad looking for a, a witness that would say that she saw Annie McCarrick in the cafe. She, she would be so valuable. And even if she didn't report it to the incident room, if she reported to any guard or detective, sure, they would pass it on. Why wouldn't you pass information like that, sure? Frustrated by the lack of an official response, in July 2020, Una Wogan shares her mother's story with the McCarrick's private investigator, Brian McCarthy. If this lady had given a member of the Garda information that she believed she'd seen a female and a male in Poppy's Cafe, are there other people who've given information that's never been followed up on that could well provide an answer to some of the questions we're asking? 
My mum passed away in 2020, but in 2021, the guards contacted me and came and took a statement from me, which was a second-hand statement, really. Do you know, I couldn't give the details that my mum could. She wanted to get her story out there and, and thought it might help. She felt for Annie's mother. I mean, she has five daughters of her own, so... There was appeal after appeal every year, every 10 years, every anniversary. And what were they appealing for? She was given the information, but nobody came to get it from her, you know? There are other questions about Annie's disappearance that trouble her family. Her room was mostly a big, huge brass bed that we, uh, you know, laid around on and chatted and listened to music and did silly things that teens do. Linda Ringhouse is one of Annie's closest childhood friends. Anne was my first and oldest best friend from four years old on. Anne and I lived close until she was 12 years old. After that, the family bought a beautiful house on a canal in the next town over. Linda visited Annie in Ireland shortly before she disappeared. It was just kind of a magical time. Um, really got to see her in her new element, I guess you would say. Why don't you all come move over here? It's great over here. You'd love it. Come on, come on. Back in the United States, a few days after Annie disappears, Linda and Annie's aunt Maureen contact her close US friends to see if they might know something. <laughs> what they hear alarms the family. They now begin to wonder if Annie has been taken by someone she knows. We found out from her friends that uh, she had been having quite a bit of difficulty with someone she knew. And we were totally unaware of that. She hadn't let us know about it. So I guess she thought she could handle it herself and things would, would be all right. She had confided that someone she knew was harassing her. She had confided that she messed up, messed up bad, and that she had been with this person um, a week before she went missing. Maureen also discloses some disturbing new information. I was told something in confidence by Anne that someone that Annie had known had struck her when they were in a drunken state. These things were kind of coming out as we were all brainstorming on what could have happened. I wanted to make sure that information was put out there, should it be pertinent to any investigation or suspicions. Deeply concerned, they decide to act. Four or five of us each faxed uh, our statements over. The faxes are sent to the B&B in Dublin, where Annie's uncle, John Covell, is staying. He is certain he passed this information on including the reference to Annie having been struck. Immediately, we took that right to the Gardaí and gave that to the Gardaí. None of the information in these faxes is made public at the time. Meanwhile, the Garda and media focus remains on Johnny Foxes and the surrounding area. As the searches continue, Annie's family and friends begin to wonder if the Garda are looking in the wrong place. I don't think she was at Johnny Foxes that night. She was very chatty. She really liked to have conversations and meet people between her beauty and just how kind she was, and she was an American, there would have definitely been more than just a doorman remembering her. The, the media say Annie McCarrick was in Johnny Fox's. People believed she was in Johnny Fox's, and then it itself grew legs. 
No one else could verify Annie was there. No one's seen her outside Johnny Fox's. No one's seen her getting into a car with Johnny Fox's. No one put her in any place near Johnny Fox's at any time on that particular day. One of the things that's really frustrating is that we were never contacted by the Garda regarding our faxes and some of the information we put in. Information that, you know, to us uh, <laughs> was very telling, uh, at least, uh, you know, something to be questioned, but it never happened, uh, as far as I can remember. But might there be another reason for this? These faxes never came into the position of the investigation team. I was never aware of these faxes. They definitely would have taken the investigation in a different direction. That is a source of annoyance and frustration to me. And I would know it to be a source of annoyance and frustration to all of the investigation team. Val Smith was the detective who questioned the people named by Annie's family. He, too, did not know about the faxes. I'm not aware that anyone known to Annie hit her. There was never any question of assaulting Annie at any time. Val Smith is confident the team fully investigated all leads based on the information available to them at the time. And when I ever took a statement off in relation to Annie McCarry, they were alibied. We go back and everything she, they said that she was and where they were and that sort of thing, and we would either tr prove it true or false. Mr McCarrick would be meeting senior Garda officers tomorrow to review the case. But do they think Annie is still alive? No. As hopes of finding Annie alive begin to fade, and increasingly frustrated with the investigation, the family compile a list of questions they want answered. You just don't know which way to turn or whom to, to think the worst of. And you're afraid to do that because you don't want to accuse someone who's totally innocent. But, but then you wonder, well, would they have hurt her? Would, would they have just gone off and, and done something totally unintentional? But at least that way she wouldn't have suffered? but you're just left not knowing anything. On March the 26th, Gardaí are more than 99% sure she was at Johnny Fox's pub in Glencullen. The McCarricks had reservations that actually grew in the months that followed um, when they found that they weren't getting answers to questions that they were putting out there and asking legitimately. The whole relationship had broken down. Certainly, many Carricks felt had broken down with the Garda. Armed with these questions, the family attend a meeting with senior Gardaí. They had a daughter who was missing, and there was questions that needed to be answered. John actually made a stamp that he used for months. Someone knows. He used to put on all his letterheads. Brian McCarthy is present at this meeting in Donnybrook Garda Station. It takes place a year after Annie's disappearance. The Garda were sitting across from us, so it was more inquisitorial. The meeting turned into a you said, we said, they said. And it was just a finger pointing. John himself got a, a little bit upset. He walked out of the meeting. Eventually, John is convinced to rejoin the meeting. The family hoped that the Garda could have shared some information with them. No one was asking them to share confidential information. People were asking them for specific questions that could have been a yes or no answer. That meeting, it was confrontational from the point of view that Mr. McCarrick was quite adamant that he wanted um, these questions answered. The Gardaí were quite prepared to deal with the questions and to provide the, uh, the answers to him as best we could. 
As the meeting concludes, it is agreed that Tom Rock will meet with another security expert hired by the McCarricks in the hope that it will address the family's concerns. I spent the full day with him. I gave him access to all of the statements, and particularly some of the statements that he, he wanted particularly to read. But one of the things he did was he expressed total confidence in the way the Gardaí had investigated it. I can understand the feelings of the family, and I can understand their, their uh, times, their anger, and their discontent with the, with the Gardaí. You have to remember that we were still looking ahead that if Annie McCarrick was found, and if it was proven that she had died a violent death, we would be dealing with a court case, a trial in the Central Criminal Court. So there were certain issues there that we could not disclose from that point of view. Annie has now been missing for three decades. After a woman told Gardaí she saw a woman resembling Annie trying to hitch a lift on the evening she disappeared. In the intervening years, Gardaí follow a number of fresh leads, but the mystery of Annie McCarrick's disappearance remains. It leaves her family still seeking answers. There were many questions that John and Nancy certainly had, and we all had, that, okay, if there was a person in Annie's recent past that was violent towards her, do you know that person's whereabouts every minute of every, you know, every hour of the day Annie went missing? Never, ever did we get an answer to that, which was disappointing. Officially, Annie McCarrick is listed as a missing person, but privately, detectives fear the worst. That there's someone out there could have that vital piece of information. Until March of this year, the disappearance of Annie McCarrick remained officially classified as a missing persons case. Continuing, and the file will remain open until she is found. Two days before the 30th anniversary of Annie's disappearance, that all changed, after Nancy wrote directly to Garda Commissioner Drew Harris, requesting an upgrade. Today, Garthi at Irish Town Station upgraded the Annie McCarrick case to a murder inquiry. This morning, I am making a public appeal for information. I want to speak to any person who met, spoke with, or had any interaction with Annie McCarrick on the 26th of March 1993. There is a person or persons who have information who haven't yet spoken to Garthi or who may have spoken to us already, but were not in a position to tell us everything at the time. The new team of investigators have pledged to leave no stone unturned. Myself and the senior investigating officer have recently visited Nancy McCarrick and some of her family in New York. I and the investigation team are determined to gather all information and evidence available to us to find answers and to bring the matter to a positive conclusion. We will be exploring all avenues. It makes a huge difference to hear that her case has been upgraded to a murder investigation. You never know, it might prompt someone to come forward after all these years. And as hard as they have worked to investigate it through the years and as many programs as they've done and newspaper articles, but it, it evidently requires that upgrade uh, in order for a reinvestigation to take place. Her father, John, passed away in 2009 without knowing what happened to his daughter. The decision to upgrade Annie McCarrick's case to murder after 30 years gives her family renewed hope. Because in a murder case, Gardaí have more powers to arrest and detain suspects. If there is nobody, then you have no crime scene. But with the additional resources and personnel available to a murder investigation, an upgrade can sometimes help to produce real results. <laughs>